Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Mark Raven, a senior advisor with Kinexus. We're uh, pleased to bring you this webinar as part of our ongoing continuous improvement webinar series. The webinar today is titled Four Key Steps to Get Buy-In. And our presenter is Sarah Baker. She's a consultant and facilitator with IQC. So thank you to everybody uh, for being here today. Um, and uh, we'll get started um, right into the presentation shortly. Um, so with that, let me introduce today's presenter. Um, again, her name is Sarah Baker. Uh, she's a consultant and facilitator at IQC. Uh, and this is the same organization. Um, Scott Bergmeier has done two webinars uh, in our series before. So you may recognize the name IQC. Um, but Sarah has an MS in Industrial and Organizational Psychology and a BA in Philosophy and Psychology. So Sarah challenges and inspires others to think critically and to shift toward more effective perspectives. And I know she'll do that um, for us today. Um, her thoughtfulness and enthusiasm and passion for learning support her in providing excellent work um, to the people she works with and again today. And as, as a facilitator, she uses philosophy and psychology techniques to inspire growth and excellence. So she is uh, well positioned to talk to us today on uh, this, this very important topic of uh, getting buy-in and, and working with others. So with that, Sarah, um, thanks again for presenting. I'll turn it over to you. All right, sounds good. Thanks so much for the great introduction. So today we're gonna talk about the four key steps to get buy-in. Before we get started, I'd like to hear from everyone in the room. Oh, actually. So first I'll just do a brief introduction on IQC. Um, what we do is consulting, training, and we work with an ex excellence program that's a nationwide program to measure how well your organization is doing and how committed they are to performance excellence and performance improvement. So that's who I've been working with and Scott Bar Bergmeier, the um, person that I directly work for has been amazing in facilitating my growth and development personally. So today we're gonna hit on three key things. We're gonna work on understanding what buy-in is about, what you need whenever you need buy-in. What's the process? What's the four-step process of getting buy-in? Because it doesn't happen all at once. There's stages. So we're gonna go through those four stages. And next we're gonna reflect on how it relates to us personally, how it relates to us in our organizations, and what's difficult about it. How could it benefit us to know how to better get it? Because we don't always ask those questions and sometimes there's some answers behind those. So before we get started with that, I wanna ask the audience to please go ahead and put in the chat, what is buy-in to you? What does it mean? What does that word mean? Sometimes we talk about it. What is it? Do you see those responses, Sarah, or do you want some help reading those out? Uh, I don't see the responses. Give me okay. just a few quick bursts of what people are saying. Yeah, so people are putting in uh, investment, want to okay. do it, or pull, um, support the new idea, acceptance with one's own terms. Someone else says, honestly, it's a mystery to me. Uh, acknowledging, <laughs> um, getting agreement and acceptance, commitment, support, trust in each other, consensus, involvement and commitment, engagement, ability to see things on the same perspective. Um, oh, one more here, empowerment through agreement. Wow. Awesome. Okay. I love hearing all those responses. Agreement, acceptance, a lot of really great words. Okay. Now that we're in touch with what buy-in is about, another question for you. What does it take for you to buy in to something? What does it take? We'll see what the, uh, so, okay, here we go. Uh, trust. Acknowledgement of my concerns, selling the outcome, trust again, openness, uh, deep understanding, trust in the person who's asking. A lot of trust responses from people there. Wow. That's interesting. We'll cover some of that later on. What else are we hearing? Um, we got credibility and trust, confidence, partnership, inspiration, understanding the issue and the strategy. Uh, transparency, 
connection, understanding the why. Okay, great. Great. Awesome set of responses. We've got a lot of thoughtful people in the audience today. Um, So notice that a lot of those words relate to how you feel and or what you want. They're not exactly rational words. Buy-in is related to a kind of feeling or some kind of sensation. You sense whether you can trust someone or not. That's not something that you can pull up on a data sheet and just figure out the answer, whether or not someone's trustworthy. It's kind of something that you um, sense. It also can't exactly be forced. Can someone force you to trust them? No, they can't. They might show you as best as they can that they're trustworthy. Can they force you to trust them? No. Um, So there's trying to do your best and get your best shot at being perceived as trustworthy. But that's the best you got. You can't go farther than that to the point of, I'm trustworthy and you're going to believe that because all of a sudden you don't trust that person. So it's kind of like how the job of marketers is to identify what people want and what they desire so that they can create what that is in other people. So if you can say, okay, people want trust. People want to trust me before they're going to do anything for me. All right, let's see what I can do to make that happen. What are all the things I can do to make myself be perceived as more trustworthy? Can you, you know, can you guarantee it? No, you can do the best you can. So let's go walk through the process of how you do that. So four steps. First step, choose an opportunity. You have to have something specific that you want someone to buy into. And this is tricky because a lot of times people don't actually get specific enough in what they want someone to buy into. There's still a lot of questions that are left unanswered. And so there's a lot of important pieces in getting those questions answers. Next, it's aligning to others' motives. This is the key part in this entire presentation. A lot of times we see the world from our perspective and we don't try to understand how someone else will see something. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean from the get-go that if they don't see the world from the same point of view that we do, that they can't buy in to what we're trying to get them to buy into. No, it's just a matter of communicating the message differently. So that's key. Next is ask for reactions. A lot of times we don't test out something that we want people to buy into before we just automatically say, hey, by the way, this is what we want, here you go. They don't test it out. In marketing, they often test out a product before they completely launch it for a good reason. You wanna know what people think, what are the questions people are asking, what are some gaps, what are the holes? You have to do that before you're gonna be able to get buy-in because if you haven't asked all of those questions and if you haven't filled those holes, Someone else is going to be wondering, what's that? What's going to happen there? They don't know what they're doing. So how should I trust them if they don't know what they're doing? So you clearly have to test everything out first a little bit. So with buy-in, you test out the idea. Next, you agree on an action plan. So agreement, that's actually something we heard earlier on in the chat. You work with somebody and you come to an agreement. You don't just act without their awareness. So what this means is it's not necessarily 50-50, sit down and go back and forth and you compromise. There's a lot of other alternatives to just pure, simple, what we think of as compromising. So we're going to go over those a little bit more in depth now. The first one, which is choose an opportunity. The biggest struggle here is people don't get specific. So there's a lot of different specific problems that you can have. Oh, there's a specific type of thing that is broken. Oh, there's a part in our process that is inefficient. Oh, there's a lack of general um, acceptance of this new policy, whatever. There's a specific issue. But what happens is people just... 
they go off and they say, there's this big problem and we need to fix it right now. Well, what exactly is the problem? You have to define it very clearly. If you don't, people are going to question what you're trying to do. So, for example, saying, oh, here's my solution. I know exactly what the problem is. Here's the solution. It's going to improve our culture. And it's going to make people happier. Well, what's the problem with the culture? Is there a problem with the culture? And how do we know? that. We're operating off of assumptions. And maybe from your perspective, it's very clear. But oftentimes we don't take a step, a minute to just think, oh, maybe that's not actually clear to the other person. So sometimes you have to show them some data. Maybe you have to say, hey, look, here's our turnover rates over the last year. They're high and increasing. And they're having a huge impact on our workforce and our productivity. That data is a great start at communicating exactly what's wrong and not just saying some high level there's an issue. Make it make it concrete. A lot of people don't do that. Everyone, because we're so wrapped up in our perspective, it's very obvious in our heads. We're thinking very rationally and we just jump from idea to idea to idea to the conclusion. And if other people don't have the same assumptions that we're making, they're not going to get to the same end. So you have to do that for them. So next, what do you do once you define what an issue is? You have to align the issue with what the person is motivated by. So in a lot of cases, people are motivated by Similar things. In an organization, a lot of people might be motivated by being effective. Some people are motivated by learning and growth. Some people are motivated by the mission, vision, and values. And that truly is what motivates them to go to work and to work hard to improve. For some people, it's reputation. It's who are they going to be and appear in, in society and to others. For some people, it's the big picture possibilities. People are all motivated by similar things, but just to different degrees. And you have to understand who you're speaking to and what motivates them before you can get them to buy in. Because that's speaking to that, that part in their head that's not rational, the emotional part, which ultimately is where buy-in comes from. It's not a rational thing, it's emotional, and you have to tap that piece into people. So I'm going to tell a quick story. Uh, a long time ago, not recently whatsoever, I had a friend and he was terrible at saving money. He earned a lot of money, but he spent it constantly to the point where his bank account would end up close to zero on a regular basis. And it was causing some havoc in his life. He was concerned, upset, creating stress, all that. I first tried convincing him, look, you need to save money. It's the responsible thing to do. Slow your spending and you'll have more security in the long run. He didn't care. He didn't care about security. He doesn't like feeling restricted. That's what he said to me. He said, I don't like feeling restricted. I don't care about security. That's not me. So then I realized, oh, okay, I need to approach this from a different angle. So I said, all right, you're motivated by freedom, aren't you? And I said, don't you feel restricted in your job? Don't you feel restricted by the schedule that you have, which he had told me earlier was frustrating him. He didn't like being stuck in the specific schedule he was working. And I said, don't you feel like you don't have a lot of freedom in that? And he said, oh, okay. He was smart. He said, I realize where you're going. You're saying, I'm trapped in my job because my spending habits keep me stuck in an area where I have to make a certain income and I don't have enough free time to develop my skills. And you're saying that if I save some money, 
that I might be able to buy myself more freedom. Yes, exactly. And he actually started to change his behavior. This is what we need to do on a larger scale for other people. We think that in our heads, communicating, hey, this is what we need to do. We think it's obvious. You know, your bank account's getting close to zero. We think it's quite obvious what the problem is. But the other person's not going to see it as a problem unless you're speaking in their language. So speaking to somebody in their language is the most essential piece of getting buy-in because that's where you get the alignment where they can even start the buy-in process. So think about who you're talking to there and maybe ask them. Sometimes you don't know off the bat. Maybe you don't know someone well enough. You're like, well, I don't know this person or I don't know this group of people, this audience. Ask questions. That's often the best way to get the answer that you need. Um, that's a way to get started. So that's step two, the key piece that I'm trying to drive home in this message. Step three, you've got to test it out. You've got to test out your idea and get information that will help you better understand your target market, whether that's your CEO, whether that's a group of managers, whether that's staff, you test out the idea in that type of population to that type of group, and you see what are the responses I'm getting? What are the gaps? What are the questions that they have? What are the holes that I need to fill before I actually can get people to buy into this? It's crucial. But a lot of times we're so excited about our improvement project idea that we just want to go and we don't want to test anything out first. We just want action now. It doesn't take long. P toss it by a few people, especially the types of people that you need buy in from. See what reactions there are. And then you can work to better go back to step two and align your project to the motives that are going to drive other people to act. So after step three, we've got, hold on, step four, and that's agree on action. Before you start developing an action plan, ask yourself three questions the ones that are listed on this screen, actually. What do you absolutely need for this project to work? What are you going to ask for? So there's a difference between those two things. What do you absolutely need is the bare minimum essentials. What you're going to ask for is obviously going to be a lot more than that. That's what you could hopefully achieve and hopefully get if you want to do this project completely and have it run smoothly and at the timeline that you would want, ideally. You need to come up with those beforehand. Same thing with the third one. What are you willing to give? Because a lot of times we're focused on what we're going to get from staff, leadership, management, whoever we're trying to get buy-in from. We're asking the question, how can I get from you? We also need to ask the question, what can I give back? So if we're asking for time, we need to show them what are they going to get back in return for that. And we need to show that we're willing to work with them. We're not, we don't already have this pre-planned, pre-packaged idea in our heads, and we're insistent that that is the right way. But no, we're open to working with how the outcomes are going to be achieved. Maybe the outcome still has to be achieved, maybe in a slightly different way, and you're willing to work. A lot of times what people don't like is working with somebody who knows they're right 100% and the exact way that they're doing something is perfectly right. Uh, sometimes you can't trust that person because it seems like they're interested in preserving their reputation and preserving their rightness more so than being open to other potentially better alternatives or solutions. 
And so you really generate trust with people when you show them that you're willing to give a little bit and you're willing to work with them. You still know that you want to achieve that outcome and you're not giving that up. But you work with it around how it happens. So that's step four. I'd like everybody to go back to that chat and put in what's a benefit of being able to get buy-in from people. We'll see what people have to say. Here we go. Uh, benefits, collaboration, easier execution, commitment, success, deep commitment and ownership, clarity, less resistance, sustainability, alignment, relationship building, higher morale, uh, accomplishing, reaching the challenge, ability to launch. Those are some great, great responses. Accountability. All right. Awesome. Good ones. Yeah. Ultimately, another one uh, that relates to all those words, but another key one is motivation. When you get people to buy in, they're motivated. They'll do anything to achieve that outcome that they're bought into. If somebody's bought into a product, they'll do anything to get it um, within reason. So plenty of great answers there. I love hearing that. Now I wanna ask, and this question can kind of go to the Q&A for some answers if people would like that. What step do you have the most challenge with? Of the four steps. And the four steps are listed up there mm -hmm. so you can review. Yeah, thank you for having that up there. I'm curious to hear what people have to say. And again, you can go ahead and put that in the chat. It's a lot to think about and mull over. Yeah. Um, so we're not seeing any responses yet, but. Um, okay, here we go. Alignment to others. Uh, alignment. One, choosing the opportunity. Two, alignment. Two, alignment. Three and four, asking for reactions and agree on action plan. Uh, alignment. Four, agreement. Uh, two, again, alignment. Uh, yeah, I mean, I see so many times, just as a quick comment, people are jumping right to number four. They're trying to get agreement on the action plan. And, and, and that's why this is so beneficial today, Sarah, you pointing out these other steps in, in this process. So yeah, I mean, if there, there's a winning, most popular answer here was number two, getting alignment to others. Okay, awesome, good to hear. Mm -hmm. Because that's actually one where you have a lot of ability to achieve that just asking some questions, figuring out the answers, you can get that one done. So it's good to hear. All right, well, this is my concluding slide for the presentation. I just wanted to say thank you, Mark, for having me here and for allowing me to speak today. Truly, buy-in is one of the most important things that people can learn. And it's not just about continuous improvement projects. You can get someone to buy into anything, being friends with you. I mean, it's not exactly the same process, but you show somebody, hey, you know, we speak the same language and we can achieve certain outcomes. Cool. You get people to buy into anything that you want to. Um, decisions that you make or that you want them to make, changes, any kind of thing that you can think of, buy-in is important there. Because without it, people don't act. If people aren't bought into something, they don't get out of bed in the morning. They do because they're bought into the idea that something else matters. Something is important. And you have to show that to them or they won't move. And a lot of what we do in organizations is we want people to move. We want people to create results. We want people to act and have an impact in the world. 
so truly, buy-in is connected with the entire purpose and the entire function and the entire goal of any organization. So just a little bit about the importance there. And with that, I'll pass it back over to you, Mark. Thanks All right. again. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so we encourage people, go ahead and continue putting in uh, questions. We, we have time for um, a good long Q&A session. When we get survey feedback, nobody ever complains that the Q&A was too long. Usually the complaint is if the Q&A is too short, but thank you for you know, really, um, uh, re really helpful thoughts effectively shared here, Sarah. Um, one just quick point of process that I should have mentioned up front. You may have noticed today um, a, a bit of an experiment with the live subtitles on screen. Um, recently had gotten some feedback where somebody had made a suggestion um, that um, they, they, they asked us if we would consider trying doing the live subtitle function. Um, I think from an accessibility standpoint, if somebody is hard of hearing or um, other circumstances um, where subtitles are helpful, we tried that today. So um, thank you, Sarah, for um, going along and, and trying that out today. Uh, the way the technology works through uh, PowerPoint, it only picks up Sarah's voice on her end locally to do that subtitling. So as we get into the Q&A, you'll see more of the subtitles again. And uh, as you put the questions in again, please do use uh, the Q&A tab. If there's anything in chat, I'll, I'll get those too, but it's easier for me to moderate if you do Q&A. All right, so a few quick announcements before we get to those questions, if you can advance it, please. Um, upcoming webinars. Uh, we, do, we don't have anything else open for registration right now, um, but if you want to get updates about uh, future webinars and the ability to um, go and register for those as they're announced, you can sign up for email updates by going to kinexus.com slash webinars. We also have, speaking of webinars, uh, a full library of uh, well over a hundred recorded webinars. You know, we do these roughly monthly. Um, there's a lot of great content in there. It's all free. So if you go to kinexus.com slash webinars, look on the right-hand side of the page where you see um, the on-demand webinar library. You can also find all of those on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a blog at blog.kinexus.com. A lot of great reading there. We invite you to check that out. You can also subscribe to get those blog posts sent to you via email if you like. And then the final thing I'm going to mention in terms of resources, we have the Kinexus podcast. If you're already uh, a subscriber or follower to the podcast, you might have heard the short preview episode that Sarah and I did to introduce her and give a preview to today's webinar. Um, as always, the full audio of today's session will be there available in the podcast feed that'll be in there later today. Uh, if you want to revisit, if you want to listen to any of this, if you want to send a link um, to colleagues, uh, we encourage you to share it that way as well. And so with that, um, We'll have Sarah's uh, contact info on screen and uh, her email address. Somebody had asked about a website. That's um, iowaqc.org um, uh, is the website there. Um, just comment here, great presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as a question, this may be more of a suggestion. Sarah, do you have a book? Maybe there's a book in your future on this topic. That's actually a really good question. I'm in the process of writing a book and we're about 50% mm. having the first review by some editors done. And just a little preview, the title and the topic of the book is on self-leadership. Self-leadership. Well, maybe we can hear a little bit more about that if, uh, if we have time here. So now while we're waiting for your book, um, there was a related question here. Do you have any recommended reading on this topic of buy-in, any resources that you would point people to uh, today? That's a great question. So I'm gonna actually take some time to be thoughtful with that and write out some, come up with the list. And if I could be put in contact with whoever could be curious about that, I'd be happy to review the resources that I have. So uh, one thing, yeah, well, thank you. One thing we can do, if you send that to me, we can put that in the follow-up email that's sent out to everybody um, that'll, that'll come out tomorrow. 
Okay, great. Then I'll make a very thoughtful response and we will send that out to everyone. Okay. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, we've got a question here from Brian. How have you or others approached senior executives to get their attention to even approach them with an idea for buy-in? So I, I don't know if this is about the like the idea of buy-in conceptually and what they could or maybe should be doing to help gain buy-in. I think that's the in, intent of the question as opposed to a specific example of trying to get buy-in from senior executives. Um, maybe first, let, I'll, I'll frame it, let me throw it back to you again as, okay, so Brian clarified, just getting them to meet with you to talk about the topic of buy-in. Sure, so how I would approach that and I've, how I've heard that others have successfully approached that is that they don't jump to senior leadership first. Mm -hmm. They hang out at step three for a while and it might be uncomfortable, it might be frustrating whenever there's a problem that you want solved more quickly, but hanging out at step three and seeing if you can get buy-in of the people just under them. If you can get them, you can move forward. But a lot of times we try to jump to senior leadership because they have the power. They ultimately have the decision-making authority. It makes sense why we would jump to them first. But if we get any resistance with that, go level down. We'll work on getting buy-in there. And then those people can vouch for you or your idea. So that's how I would approach it. That's how I know that people have successfully approached things like that before. I mean, it seems like there's this conundrum here of, or maybe it's an opportunity to use the four steps you shared today, sir, to get buy-in about the topic of trying to gain buy-in. And I imagine it's hard because a lot of times executives rise through the ranks and they have decades of habit of trying to force change on people. Maybe they're focused on selling change instead of really kind of you know having more of a discussion with people of inviting feedback and not just pushing. So uh, yeah. your thoughts on applying this method to that question of buy-in, Sarah? Exactly. A lot of times forcing is the kind of relationship that we have with people. But what happened earlier today is we set up a chat and we asked people, what does it take to get buy-in? And they said, trust. If someone's going to force you to do something, whether you want to or not, that's not a relationship. That's not a person that you trust. So ultimately, it doesn't work. Now, how can you convince someone else that they're doing the wrong thing? How do you convince someone you're approaching this the wrong way? You need to buy in to how to do buy in right. Yeah. You know, to that, I would go back to the idea that you can't force buy in. If you're trying to force them to approach something the right way, they don't trust you. It creates that same type of dynamic. And so you got to take a step back, use this approach. It's the best approach that you've got. It is the best shot that you have at getting it. Can you force people to do anything, do the right thing? No, you can't. And it's unfortunate. A lot of times, we would want to, but it won't work. Yeah. And there's a lot of consequences of doing that too. Yeah. And again, boy, I mean, that's, that's so true. You can't force people to do something. And, and let's say somebody has positional power where they can force people to do something. Um, you know, I would argue a compliance culture is not the same. Uh, it's not as, uh, it's not as good as, a continuous improvement culture where people truly are bought in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can't force people to buy in. You might be able to manipulate people enough to get them to comply with something, but they won't be motivated on their own to do it. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to hold in place a lot of those firm structures that keep them behaving like that. And that's a house of cards. Mm -hmm. So not effective. Um, yeah, I, I love how you emphasize earlier, you talked about understanding people's motivation and not like collectively on average, but like very specifically 
each person's motivation might be different. So I thought that was very well stated. But, you know, as a follow-up question to that, what can you do, if anything, if you discover through this conversation, you, you can't find that motivation, you can't find alignment? What, what, is there anything that you can do then at that point? Okay, sure. So if we're still talking about um, an individual, um, right. that's separate from if we're going to a group level. Yeah, um, individual, yeah. Okay, yeah. If we're talking about a specific individual, you can find it. You have to ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So people show in how they act and the choices they make, what they value what motivates them. For some people, you can see that the types of decisions they make or how they act show they truly value efficiency. Efficiency is what they care about. Other people you see through their actions, they'll put the mission over efficiency. And you'll see that in their decisions. You'll see that in their behavior. So you oftentimes have to watch Sometimes you can go about it by asking them directly. Sometimes people don't even, they don't even have enough self-awareness to be able to tell you. Most of the time, that's the case. Um, but you can see it in their behavior and the decisions that they make, what matters to them more. You know, because we're all motivated by the same core things, but it's just a different scale. Some people it's higher on one, some people it's lower on the other. You can see what they rank typically through their decisions and behaviors over time. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of effort. I understand that that's not easy to do, especially if you're looking at more than one person. If you're looking at a team of people and you're assessing each of them individually, each of their behaviors, each of their motivations, to try to figure out how to sell this idea to them, it takes a lot of time and effort to watch them long enough to get any kind of trend but that's what it takes if you're going to use this best approach. That's what it takes. That's part of what you give. I mean, it sounds, I mean, yeah, the, these conversations and these discussions take time, but it's about, you know, effectiveness. Um, you know, I'm re reminded of uh, a Toyota expression that gets thrown around a lot. Um, you, you have to go slow to go fast. So it sounds like the, you know, my, my take my read of, of these four steps of, these pro, of this process is that it does take time to engage with people, to understand people, um, to, to invite their feedback, but it's, it, it's time consuming, but it's necessary. And then if you really can then get alignment around the action plan, step four, maybe that's where you can start going fast. If you went slower in steps one, two, three. Exactly. And sometimes it's the reverse. Sometimes it's okay, you know, you don't spend a ton of time on getting alignment in the beginning, but you get people that are, uh, they're just tolerant enough of the idea that they're open to it. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning on step two, you go fast, but then that might mean that down on step four, you slow down because you have to kind of backtrack and get that alignment during that, those stages where you're making decisions and you're getting them to actually act. So sometimes it, it flip-flops. If you go slow and on step two, you can go quicker on step four. Mm -hmm. If you go fast on step two, sometimes it'll slow down. Obviously, some situations, it's great. You can go fast on both. Some situations, it takes some time all throughout. And that tends to be when a decision is bigger, has a greater impact, or is more difficult. Uh, so some of that varies. I, it seems like, be curious, curious to hear your thoughts on this. If we think we have alignment and we're moving forward or we're going too fast and we're listening, like it seems like there would be a feedback loop from people saying, okay, whoa, wait a minute. Um, we need to slow down. What, what are your thoughts on that? Exactly. Yeah, on step three, if you're paying any attention, You'll hear signals from people that, oh, you know what? That's not perfectly thought out yet. We have to do some more thinking before we really plan anything. Um, if you're like watching on step three for people's reactions, they'll tell you the truth. They'll tell you 
if they have any kind of lingering suspicions or questions that aren't answered, they keep them from buying in. Uh, people are pretty transparent when you're paying attention to them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's tricky, though, to want. What the challenge is, is um, it's often difficult to want to know what they really think, because sometimes it means that you have to change your initial plan. You mm-hmm. have the plan in your head. You get feedback from others on step three that says, oh, you know, maybe that's not quite right. And maybe we need to adjust a little bit. You don't want to hear that. People don't like hearing that. And so sometimes they close themselves off from hearing the feedback that they need to successfully do step four. And that's what holds us back a lot of the times. It's putting up that wall and saying that we're right. Mm -hmm. And being stubborn with that instead of listening for feedback and adjusting. Exactly. Exactly. Because whether you're right or not, it doesn't matter. If you can't get buy-in, it's not going to work. So let go of being attached to whether you're right or not and focus on the solution. Focus on the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, There's a follow-up question back to the idea of uh, the need to understand people's individual motivations. There's a follow-up question that says, well, how can you go about this if you're dealing with 2,000 employees in an organization? That's daunting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. So what you would probably start out with in that case is you look at what people at a bare level are motivated by. They're motivated by security, comfort, They're motivated by freedom. They're motivated by autonomy, which is kind of related to freedom. They're motivated by competency and achievement. Um, There's a lot of basic things and uh, you can do a quick Google search to just kind of figure out what motivates people on a broad level. Come up with a list of those things. And then you start there and you communicate a message that can meet as many of those needs as possible that communicates in the language of those needs if you can. So you might include a message on, this is going to increase our productivity, blah, blah, blah. And you include a message on, this will improve our ability to live out our mission. And you dot, dot, dot. So you try to include as many of the language communications as possible. Um, Sometimes that would take a long long, long, long email or whatever it is that you're doing to communicate. And that takes too much time. So in that sense, you can assess, you can run surveys, you can take what you know from people who work directly above some of those um, staff and ask what they think, what matters more to them, this or this. Uh So assessments can work, or you just have to work with a basic understanding of, okay, people want improvement, people want autonomy, people want to be related, people want engagement, and then communicate how what you're trying to do will give them those things. Sometimes you don't know specific individuals super well, and you kind of have to work with those basics. Um, maybe, can you jump back maybe, uh, just to your slide with the four steps, Sarah, cause we've had the contact info, um, up there for a while, um, for some of these other questions. Thank you. It might be good for us to, to have that for reference. Um, there's a question that came in uh, from Julie. How do we know we have real buy-in versus somebody quote, we say we like it, but we won't make the effort required. So like the appearance Ooh. of buy-in versus true buy-in, how do you gauge that? That's a good one. That's a very good question because you're right. A lot of times people are too scared to say what they really think. Mm -hmm. So there's a long-term answer and there's a short-term answer. In the short term, the best you can do is ask, but you have to show, here's what's key. You have to show that it's okay if it's not true buy-in. You have to communicate that message because if that person doesn't believe that they'll be safe to say that, that something will happen to them. 
something, someone's going to find out. Somebody's not going to be okay with it. They won't tell you. You have to make it very clear. It is 100% okay if you say A or B. If you say yes, I truly am, or, you know, not really. Mm -hmm. And that has to be true. If that's a lie, like if, if you're telling them, oh yeah, it'll be fine. It, it won't impact you. <laughs> and then you go and, oh, people make some changes and it impacts you negatively. You show that you're not trustworthy. They won't buy into anything ever again from you. I mean, seriously, you do a lot of damage that way. So you can ask directly and that's short term. Uh, a lot of times there's really more of a long-term issue though. There's this habit that people build up where uh, they don't totally trust that it's okay to say what they think because their ideas get shut down or their opinions get uh, kind of just pushed to the side and politely ignored or whatever. And if there's a long-term history of that, that's going to determine their future behavior. And so you kind of have to break that cycle, which takes a little bit more work. But if that's truly the source of people not buying in and that's ultimately what you need, that's what it takes. It's a big change. You might have to undo years mm -hmm. of, you know, built up resentment or built up a sense of distrust. And that takes a lot of time, effort and work. You have to ask yourself the question, is it worth it? I mean, it can take a long time to build trust, to build psychological safety. It can be undone very quickly, unfortunately. Exactly. To, to your point, one bad reaction or one moment that demonstrates to people, oh, they said I could disagree. I disagreed. I felt ridiculed or diminished or ostracized in some way that... Ugh, that has a long term impact. So we, we really do have to be careful as leaders. Um, psychological safety was the topic of our last webinar um, that was presented by uh, Jessica House and Karen Ross. So I, I would invite people if you haven't checked out that webinar, I think it's very you know related. It's a, a different lens on a lot of these topics. Um, one, one thing that you see recommended in terms of, you know, uh, how do you create psychological safety or how do you strengthen it in the organization? I think one of the interesting tactics is uh, similar to what you were saying, Sarah, invite dissent or even assign somebody in a meeting. Your job is to state the dissenting view. Um, oh, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. Were your thoughts? Uh, that sounds fun. Other, other thoughts on, on that? Would you try that? <laughs> Um, other than that, it, it's entertaining and fun. Um, and a lot of times it can actually lead to more effective decision making. And actually, this is something that doesn't come from nowhere. I know that there's uh, studies done that have shown that this leads to more creative and more effective solutions, better thought out solutions. People understand the solution better when they've heard both sides. And a lot of times that side doesn't get hurt. So this is proven. It just is that that works. Um, is it perhaps better if you can get that organically? Maybe. Um, maybe you get uh, more views because there's not just one view or the other view. There's a lot of different angles. And so inviting someone to dissent doesn't necessarily open people's eyes to another alternative solution. Mm -hmm. There's often multiple. So is it probably more effective when it's organic and when people can show dissent whenever they, you know, would like to? Yeah, but the technique works. It's effective. Yeah. And that's proven. Yeah. And I think, you know, dissent, there, there, yeah, there are degrees of it. You don't want someone to just be um, oppositional. You know, I don't think it's helpful for someone to say, well, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. That, but but to, for, for somebody to, to give reactions, um, to have sort of, you know, to raise specific concerns, I think would probably be a lot more effective, whether it was organic or invited or even um, created dissent in a discussion. One other question I wanted to ask Sarah um, 
I'd be curious your thoughts on how this model, these four steps would apply. Um, many organizations and, and even as a society in different countries even are trying to gain buy-in around the idea of vaccination uh, for COVID. There are a lot of people who bought in very quickly, uh, myself included. I went and got vaccinated um, as, as soon as I could. Um, there, there were some people that were in the middle and then came along, and then there's still a percentage of people who still have concerns or they're just flat out opposed to it. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know if you've had to try to use this model with an individual or, or how would you use this model rather than just saying, hey, you know, we're doing a vaccination drive. You need to come in and do it. That's talking about the action plan. How, how would you right. try to go through those other steps? Exactly. Exactly. So this is definitely a big issue. And I'll tell you how people ought to go through this, follow those four steps. At the very end, though, I do have to conclude by saying it cannot be forced. Uh, Buy-in can't be forced. Sure. So just let's keep that in mind. But starting at step one, people have to understand that there's a problem. If people don't truly see a problem, they question data, they question whether or not it's significant, whether or not it's, you know, uh, life-threatening or whatever kind of terms they'll choose, their main argument is we don't see a problem. And so if you can't show somebody very clearly there's a problem, they won't move forward and you can't get buy-in. So the best way to do is get everything that you possibly can, data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes that doesn't quite do it. Maybe people can kind of see that, okay, maybe, but not completely. All right. So then you move them to step two. You've got them a little bit on step one. They recognize slightly their mind is a little bit open to the idea that, yeah, maybe this is a big deal. Maybe I ought to take this seriously, but I'm not sure. Then you take them to step two and you speak in their language. A lot of times people resist something like vaccinations because they value autonomy a lot. They value making their own decisions for themselves. And that type of person resists the feeling that something is being decided for them. And so you can speak in those terms to them say, um, you know, if they value their own autonomy, you can communicate, you know, this is your choice. It's not being forced on you. And yet there's benefits. Here they are. Here's what, you know, might work. So that would kind of be what you'd have to do is kind of get at what is it that they're truly wanting and or resisting when it comes to this. So a lot of times autonomy is what people are looking for whenever they're resisting something like vaccination. So you have to show them that they can still have their autonomy and they could buy into this. That's hard, but it can happen. People will do that. Um, step three, if you're talking about an individual, you can't exactly, I mean, you can ask for what others think, but yeah, maybe interview a group, interview a group of people who are opposed. Ask, why are they opposed? What are the reasons? Then you can kind of figure out more about what motivates them. And maybe there's something about that where you can communicate a message in their language that they can hear. Maybe not. Again, can't be forced, but that would be the way to go. So that would be your step three. And then your step four on vaccinations, you know, can you agree on an action plan with someone? Well, you know, you can talk about maybe when they do it. Maybe there's some choice around that. Maybe there's some choice around, um, you know, what type, what Which uh, vaccine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so maybe there's some choice there and you guys can work to talk about that. It kind of depends on the person's relationship to you whether you're talking to a large group of employees, that's very different from talking to a small group of people. Um, so again, the final word is 
You can't force buy-in. You know, you can force some behavior. You can't force buy-in. But if you follow this process, you can have the best shot at getting people up. Oh, that's mm-hmm. funny shot. Mm-hmm. Um, at getting people. <laughs> <laughs> um, at getting people to do what is good potentially for them, for society, for your company, for the world, mm-hmm. whoever. Yeah. So. And you know, there might be circumstances where. Ideally, there would be buy-in. There are circumstances where people are um, going to choose to do something even though they're not bought in. You know, and um, that might not be ideal, but you know, I think with vaccination, that is a very unique, special cause compared to workplace changes where you know health and safety w- with the vaccination is uh, is of course a driving force. Um, but thank you for kind of talking through that model. I, th- I think there's some help- helpful tactics there um, exactly. that, that we can use to increase our effectiveness. So maybe there's, there's a, a final question here, and this is all such a rich topic. Um, Scott says, uh, I work in a compliance culture company. How do I get somebody who's had success with compliance to change their mind on the topic? Um, Is there a way to explain the benefit of of buy-in? I mean, it seems like it comes back to to maybe trying to use this model. Sure. So you ask them. Sometimes uh, this is the most effective way to get someone to question the worldview is you ask them, what problems do you have? What's not going smoothly for you? Let them tell you all of the problems that are and a lot of them are likely resulting from their compliance-based approach. So get them to tell you what their issues are, what issues, especially with people that they have, which honestly takes up the bulk of most people's concerns, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, Get them to tell you what isn't working for them. And then you tell them, oh, by the way, all these things, you show them, that goes back to the fact that this is compliance based. That's, now, you know, that's the way. <laughs> yeah. Now there's risk. I mean, if somebody has had personal success or they feel like the organization is successful, they might not agree there's a problem or it would be a challenge if the leader is blaming the employees, blaming them for not going along, blaming them for not buying in. That can be really difficult to work through. Yeah, exactly. And Someone who's coming from that perspective is trying to validate their worldview. They're trying to stay inside their bubble and not change. Can you force them out of their bubble? No. But again, coming from, and if they can trust, here's here's something too. If they can trust that your goal is to help them in a, to achieving their goals, And if they can tell that that's where you're coming from, and if you communicate that you're not threatening who they are, you respect them, that's something that a lot of times people crave. Um, You respect them, you care about the same things that they care about, whether that's efficiency, whether that's the mission, whatever. You show them that you respect them, who they are, what they stand for, and that you want to help them achieve their goals then you ask them, you know, what's not working for you? What's frustrating with the people? You know, yeah, maybe it is their problem. Maybe there's a lot of problems with people. That's right. You know, people do suck. And what I have to work with is these people. And there's something you can do. It kind of get them to a state where they're willing to act. What are your thoughts, Mark? Um, well, my my main thought is that I think we're we're out of time here today. <laughs> but um, thank you for sharing your thoughts, Sarah, um, as as a presenter and um, for doing the Q and A session. There's a, a thank you in the chat. Thank you for the uh, thoughtful uh, response, and um, yeah, I really appreciate um, what you've laid out here today. So. Um, I'll, I'll share my thoughts um, some other time. So um, our presenter here today has been Sarah Baker from IQC. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, what they do, you can go to iowaqc.org.
kinexus.com. And uh, if you want to learn more about Kinexus and how we work with organizations uh, between our software and um, uh, for, for managing continuous improvement and beyond, you can go to kinexus.com. We invite you uh, to check that out. So uh, again, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for attending here today. This, uh, this was great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.